one, we can start. Okay. Uh, so is it that I start the chat immediately or first you show the slides and then I, I take over with the chatting? Uh, well, I, I can start, that's all right. Okay, then you know, go on. <laughs> So um, welcome all to DIS 2021 uh, on behalf of the local organizing committee, the IAC and our co-organizers at NICEF, Juan who is chairing this session, I welcome you to this uh, workshop that we are going to enjoy for the next uh, week. Before we start, I thought I would give you a, uh, a reminder as to how we came to this um, and why we are waiting, uh, doing this uh, online. So DIS 2020 was supposed to be at Brooklyn. Unfortunately, it was canceled due to COVID. And uh, this was the web page that uh, we last uh, put up, it's still on as just as a memory. The IS 2021 was supposed to be in Amsterdam, hosted by my current chair, Juan Rojo at NICEF. And they had all prepared for making this. Unfortunately, COVID pursued us there as well. And that could also not happen. We did not want another year without the IS. So we decided that if not in person, we at least do this on the internet and try to get the younger people in the audiences in, in our community chances to present their results. So we felt it was important to go ahead despite the fact that this was going to be on the internet. And so we decided we go ahead. We had prepared um, everything we could from the TIS 2020 at in New York. And one had started preparing um, for the 21. So we decided to combine the effort and uh, join hands with uh, Amsterdam and uh, New Amsterdam, historically New York. And one kindly agreed to join our local uh, planning committee and organizing committee. And that's where the origin of this logo is, you see the Empire State Building from the New Amsterdam or New York in the center. You see the DIS 2021, and you see the wonderful buildings of Amsterdam embedded in the logo itself. This was a, a, a design idea by Prakar Garg, one of our scientists in the group. So here we are uh, with this difficult condition um, one minute. The fact that you are here and attending this hopefully means that you are okay health wise and your families and friends are also all right. Please keep it that way. Let's hope that the worldwide vaccination and safe behavioral practices will improve in the next few months and we will be able to enjoy DIS 2022 in person. When you organize a meeting online, there are certain changes that have to happen. So here is some practical information I'd like to give you up front, and these slides will go up on the web. So those who are not with us right now, but join a little bit later, will also be able to follow them. Due to virtual nature of this meeting, we have made some changes to the normal modification or the schedule of DIS workshop. We have a single Zoom reservation. This one that you are using now will remain for all Zoom plenary uh, sessions. We have a plenary session today, the whole day. There is tomorrow, the morning session is plenary, which is the unusual part. And then Friday whole day will be plenary. And then consequently, the parallel sessions will have six Zoom reservations for six working groups. Tuesday will be a partial 
parallel session. Wednesday and Thursday will be fully on the Zoom. All Zoom links are available on the Indigo page. As long as you register for the meeting, you will have access to them. You will see them in the remote uh, login uh, location. All sessions will be recorded when you registered. There was already information about that. They will be available hopefully daily. We will try to upload all those talks with their presentations, audio and video on the same day. So our colleagues from far away, particularly Asia and on the West Coast who may not be able to join early mornings or during the afternoons will be able to see them on a daily basis. To create a simulated informal interactive space, we are going to try something new. It's called Gather Town. Many of you have used it recently in various meetings. I've seen it being used in Europe recently at the Finnish meeting of the physics day. We're gonna to try to do that here. It's accessible from the remote connection information on the Indico. So as long as you register for this meeting, you should be able to access it. We recommend using Firefox or Google Chrome. Our experience was better with those. When you enter, you'll be asked to put in your name. Please put in your real name. You can choose any clothing or anything that avatar that they ask you to do, and it will remember you. And then the next time you come in, the screen would look something like this. And then when you enter join gathering, you will see a logo DIS 2021. You enter as if you are in the lounge of a large hotel, uh, in the main lobby of a large hotel, and you will see lounges in those areas, the, a, the arrow show, you'll see a sign for a poster session. And if you can see this on your screen, I am with my avatar, I'm standing here. Everything regarding uh, movement in this space is using these keyboards, up, down, left, right. That's all you need to know. And if you go to a particular poster, when you go to the poster session, you only have to use the key X on your keyboard to open the poster and connect with the poster presenter. So it's a simple way, it's a simple procedure. I encourage you to play with it. Imagine you are in the DIS 2021 in person and enjoy small group talks in lounges, bars, and around tables. If you enter any of these lounges, lounge one, lounge three, there is also a lounge one above here that is not seen here. There are chairs, there are small chairs, there is a bar there in each of them. Act as if you are at the lobby of a hotel. And if you are at the table, only the people at the table can hear you. So you can meet with your friends and actually have an experience sitting with your colleagues who you can't be together and have a chat. There will be a 10 minute demonstration of how this works uh, in the, in today morning, at the end of today morning session just after at the lunchtime. We need to also be careful how we behave when we are in this uh, remote meeting. So we have taken the code of conduct from APS. Let the speaker finish the talk. You can raise hands during the talk or after when the questions are open and the, cha and the chair's Zoom assistant will call out your name in the end of the talk for questions and comments in the sequence, the hands were raised. The chair will decide when to stop taking questions. You can also discuss among yourself through chats to individually or to the group respectfully, use gather town to invite speakers or conference participants for longer debates and discussions. We will keep gather town open 24 hours so that all zones uh, all zones of people can use it whenever they wish. Attendees, please keep all your discussions respectful. Please respect the session chair's decision to move on to the next talk. And speakers, please respect your presentation to be in time so that there is time for people to ask questions. With these little and small instructions, 
I hope you have a great D DIS 2021. Although there are constraints on how we will act in this remote session, one of the advantages of having such a meeting is that we are reaching out to a lot more people. As you can see, as of this morning, we had 641 attendees or registered attendees. And I'm told now it's more than 650. So let's hope that more people get ex excited about our science and have a great uh, workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hawaii, for this very nice introduction. So the first speaker of this conference, the first speaker of the plenary session will be Cynthia Keppel from JLab. So I don't know if Cynthia, can you share your slides? Yes. So I'm hoping that you can see them and hear me. Yeah, it's, it's perfect. So uh, you have 30 minutes. And as Abai mentioned, we'll leave the questions for the end of the, of the talk. So if anyone has questions, please raise your hands and then Cynthia will, ask, will answer them after her talk. So the floor is yours, Cynthia. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you for this invitation and uh, boldly moving along remotely. Um, it, it's difficult, I know. <laughs> uh, so, all right. I was asked to talk about uh, part-time distribution functions at the HIX and Q Frontier. Um, I will uh, largely focus on high X. Uh, it's half an hour and a big topic. So, uh, so, so that's where I'm gonna go, but I will, will also talk a bit about high Q. Um, the present status of uh, part-time distribution functions at large X uh, was, was fairly easy to find out because we just had a meeting, the part-time distribution function for the LHC uh, just a, a week or so ago. And so what I've put here are just a smattering of plots that were shown there from the various groups working on uh, global part-time distribution function extractions. And you see one common factor, uh, and, and that is that the uncertainties at large X are all large. It doesn't matter which group, which way they're going. Um, you'll see here, these maybe look bigger than these, but note that this is these are log scale plots and this is linear. Uh, all of them have very large uncertainties. And I think this audience, we know that. So, so how are we going? How are we going to address that is what I want to talk about and why. Why is that interesting? So um, large X is the valence regime. So when I'm saying large X, uh, I mean really large X from X of around 0.3 or so up. Um, where we have these large uncertainties. And so this is the valence regime. It's the regime that gives um, a hadron its baryon number, its charge, its flavor content, its total spin. It's all coming from that valence component. And, and yet that's where we have, where this fundamental picture of the partonic structure of the hadron is, it is where we have these very large uncertainties. Um, and so knowing these, these parton distribution functions better give us a keen discriminant of our hadron structure models, what really is the structure? How do we aim at things like the baryon number? Um, also, uh, as lattice QCD becomes increasingly powerful, it facilitates comparison with that because of course the valence structure and, and the lattice are gonna be the, the comparables. Um, also, the valence regime at high X and low Q will evolve to low X and high Q. And so it really is the area where we have the intersection of uh, nuclear and particle physics. Um, our different pictures and approaches to the nucleon um, sort of sit in these high X PDFs. So there's been a new generation of experiments at Jefferson Lab focused on this high X regime. And, and that's what I'm going to largely talk about. Um, I think it's really exciting times actually for, for uh, large X physics and so hopefully Hopefully I can share a bit of that um, as well as a bit of our EIC future uh, um, as we move towards improve uh, PDFs at large X. So let me start with uh, an age old story, D over U at large X. Um, we can write down the proton wave function and spin flavor symmetric picture, whatever we're gonna do, we can write it down. And then depending on our fundamental view of what the proton looks like, do we believe that there's a very strong U quark dominance or do we believe in uh, hadron helicity conservation or do we believe in a di quark, a single quark kind of picture um, or, or maybe something more 
exciting, like a Dyson Swinger rainbow ladder or something. And any one of these uh, pictures we can take and we pick out different components of this wave function and that will give us a different prediction for D over U and for the ratio of the F2 structure function of the neutron over the F2 stru structure function of the proton. So different pictures Fundamental pictures of what the nucleon looked like give you different predictions here. And this is the subject of many review articles, and we know that it's as, as we move from our dynamic picture to something valence dominated, um, we're uh, we're not <laughs> describing this rather simple part, rather, well, uh, in principle, fundamental part quite, quite well. So a measurement is needed. Historically, again, um, this has been a problem. Um, F2n over F2p and therefore d over u has been essentially unknown for a long time, not because of only because of these co conflicting fundamental theory pictures, but also because the data has been inconclusive because we don't have a free neutron. And so we have to do nuclear corrections to get the neutron out of deuterium. Um, and depending on what you use, you use this nuclear correction or this nuclear correction or this one, you can get vastly different answers. And so theory doesn't tell us, experiment doesn't tell us, and we have been stuck without knowing the D very well. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about some solutions to that that are coming out now um, and that came out uh, recently um, and that will continue to come out uh, and, and hopefully put some light at the end of this uh, tunnel that's been a bit dark for a little while. So the first one I wanna talk about is tag tagged deep and elastic scattering, so TDIS, tagged DIS. Um, so tagged DIS is a, a kind of semi-inclusive approach, uh, but instead of doing semi-CITIS, semi-inclusive deep and elastic scattering, um, where we want to understand the current regime, what we're doing here is we're tagging specifically to choose a particular target. So in this case, um, this is creating an effective free neutron target, which is what the bonus experiment in the 6 Jev era at Jefferson Lab did. And what we did is we took a deuteron target, so a neutron plus a proton, and we have a deep and elastic event off a neutron. So how do you know you have a deep and elastic event off a neutron? Um, it's electron scattering. So the uh, it's you reconstruct the kinematics of X and Q and W all from the scattered electron kinematics. And so it's a very, very high Q, high W interaction. Um, and yet at the same time, you tag this proton going out. So in other words, you measure the scattered electron and in coincidence with a, a single very low momentum proton kind of dribbling out of the neutron, I mean, out of the deuteron out of the deuteron. And so that is the tag to tell you that you've hit the neutron target, that you've had a deep and elastic event off of the neutron. And so it turns out that that seems conceptually straightforward, but it's uh, experimentally rather challenging. Um, Theoretically, it's a bit challenging. Um, we need to be careful of things like final state interactions and, and target fragmentation. And so there are particular kinematics where this is going to, where it's going to be the case that these protons can be cleanly um, a spectator tag to guarantee that you got the neutron. In particular, experimentally, that low momentum is, is an issue uh, because very, very low momentum protons around 65, 70 MeV over C um, don't go through a piece of cardboard um, <laughs> without being stopped. And so actually measuring those coming right off of the target, getting out of the target, making a target they can get out of and measuring them um, in coincidence with this uh, high energy DIS event um, is doable, uh, but difficult. And I just want to show that it's doable very quickly because a lot of what we're going to be doing in the next years actually depends on this, this tagging approach working. So um, this is actually data from the 6 Jev era at Jefferson Lab. This is showing different momenta bites. And you can see as we begin to get to high momenta, we do get some effects. So if we stay back down here, um, our technique is working. But the most dramatic thing I think that shows it is that in the 6 Jev era at Jefferson Lab, we were able to take data in the resonance region. And so what you're looking at, this um, black data here, is the F2 structure function just from the deuteron. So this is what we've usually been battling to get the neutron out. It's very smeared. So even the elastic peak and the delta, these nominal prominent peaks when you run hydrogen are smeared out in the deuteron. And so pulling the neutron out is difficult. But the red data is actually using this proton tag. And so you can see now this neutron delta, for instance, just popping right out as soon as you tag the data. And so it gives you confidence that out in the DIS regime here, we're actually creating an effective 
neutron target. And so this is somewhat history. This is a bonus. Uh, the experiment worked multiple papers, um, uh, even put into a textbook. Uh, but in the six GeV era, we did not do, this is F2N over F2P, which translates to D over U. Um, as a function of X, we did not get out really where we would like to as high in X and Q, um, limited by the beam energy. Um, nonetheless, it was still powerful inputs to global PDS. One could do things, for instance, like look at the EMC effect in deuterium and look at tagged to untagged uh, and see how much effect uh, one had just in, in the nuclear effects in deuterium alone, which we've been battling for years and attempt to actually have a first measure of that that we could then reapply. And I'll talk a bit about that again um, in a moment. Um, where I wanted to get is that we've run again. So uh, in 2020, we actually ran bonus 12. So bonus at 12 Jeff Jefferson Lab. Um, and, uh, and so what we did was basically the same experiment. This is the beautiful Halby uh, class spectrometer. We built a new uh, radial time projection chamber, very low mass to get those low um, momentum protons out uh, through some layers of gems. Gems are, are rather low mass and a little, uh, really a drinking straw plastic deuterium target uh, in the center, again, all aimed at the low momentum. Put that in the center of class where the electrons are detected in class and we ran again. Um, and so it was just in 2020 that we were running. So I can't show you final results, but what I can show you um, is a preliminary to show you that it works. <laughs> uh, so this is just uh, inclusive deep and elastic scattering from the electrons. So you can see the target, basically, these are the walls at the end of the target and the central part of the targets. So that's just the inclusive measurement reconstructing back. Um, but now we're gonna select um, the, the low momentum protons from the deuterium target, and we're gonna put in different cuts and things. And so this is just showing you that we have the ability to do that. This is the vertex reconstruction, both from the class and from the radial time projection chamber. Um, these are the low momentum protons that we want. This is looking at the DEDX through that radial time projection chamber to show that we can get down to the momenta that we need to. And then this is the X and Q coverage. So we'll be able to push up an X and up in Q um, with this kind of tagged technique. So this is preliminary. Um, this is, uh, it's coming along. The, 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 the new RTPC that we built for 12 Jeff performed really well. Um, it had many improvements over the previous generation and analysis is ongoing. Um, that's a very difficult experiment. This kind of experiment is much, much easier to do um, at a collider. And so at the electron ion collider, and, and so why is that? It's because you don't have to build that radial time projection chamber, right? There's two beams. And so what, for instance, if, <clears throat> if we're running a deuteron beam on an electron beam, uh, then uh, the scattering, the deep and elastic event from the neutron goes on and we detect that it's a deep and elastic event. And then what we're looking for is the proton that's continuing down the beam pipe, just a little tiny bit off um, normal path. And so what one needs then is good momentum resolution, but there's no, um, there's not all of that um, target material absorbing the nucleon. So we can get down to the low momenta that we need to, to tag pretty easily. Cause it's just, um, it's now not low momenta. It's um, just, different, slightly different momenta than the beam momentum. Um, so we need to be good, uh, careful to design that we have uh, good tagging detectors so that we can look at and, and good momentum resolution. Um, so a small intrinsic spread in the machine and good momentum resolution, but this is doable and far easier. So that's part of why I was saying that this tagging technique works even in the very difficult environment at Jefferson Lab, um, because we can now push up um, to high Q uh, with this technique and actually have measurements of the F2 neutron structure function, the way in deep and elastic scattering we've had for three decades now from multiple labs, from CERN, from SLAC, from, from everywhere um, on the proton, because we have a proton target, this tagging technique now gives us a neutron target. And so this is from the ESC white paper, what does this buy us? Um, <laughs> so what you're looking at is, um, just the uh, electron alone plus tagging over what you have um, from regular DIS. So basically what is the uncertainty reduction by uh, putting in the tag data? So now you have a neutron that's tagged. Uh, and so you see that we're getting very, very large improvements in, um, for instance, here's D over U, the purple, right? So we're getting 20, 25% type improvements in our PDFs out here at large X where we want them. So this is quite exciting. Um, possibility for the EIC. 
Um, but the tagging technique offers even um, uh, more excitement, I guess, uh, or additional excitement, I should say. Um, we can actually use this technique to go for also the pion structure function. So the same way that we created an effective neutron target with tagging, we can create an effective pion target. And so how are we going to do this magic? Uh, what we're going to do is leverage the fact that sometimes the proton is a, a P pi zero or an N pi minus. Um, and, and then do the same thing. We have that very high energy DIS event off the pion and we detect that proton uh, or neutron um, just moving along the beam so that it did not interact. So we have a high DIS event from something other than the beam target. So it's the, the pion in the, in the uh, nucleon pion fluctuation. So this is the Sullivan effect doing this. Um, so the nucleon, the pion, um, picture is here. This is the Sullivan picture. We scattered DIS off of this. We now also have um, T uh, and some other variables that come in. Um, the T is the, the square, the Form momentum at the at the vertex, so how much is going to pion? Um, but we create a pion target this way, and so now, um, just as I was saying, we have uh, the ability to have a neutron target, and we're, whereas we've been living on thirty years of proton DIS, um, we'll have a neutron DIS. Now we'll also have pion DIS, and so we can look at the pion parton distribution functions um, in a way that we've really never been able to before, not even with a difficult Jefferson Lab experiment. So um, why? Why do we want to do that? This is like a laundry list and I'll leave it up, um, but I do want to go through it very quickly because um, perhaps this is a bit new to some of you. The pion um, is fundamental. Um, it Obviously, it plays a key role in both nucleon and nuclear structure. And viewed one way, it's the simplest hadron you could possibly have, right? Two valence quarks when we're looking at large X in the valence regime. So it should be really easy to model. And so a test bed for basic QCD predictions. But viewed another way, it's highly complex. It's, um, it's a dressed quark antiquark state. It's the QCD Goldstone boson. So it's associated with uh, dynamic chiral symmetry breaking. And late, um, recently, it's becoming clear that it's, it's actually one of the keys to understanding emergent mass mechanisms. And so this is just a kind of picture of that. This is the proton mass and the pion mass budget. And you'll see that very tiny sliver, the, the gray in either, is coming from the Higgs mechanism. But the other two mechanisms going here are the chiral limit mass and then the emergent uh, hadron mass um, feeding back with the Higgs mechanism, so this dynamic QCD process. And, and the proton actually is the chiral and the pion is more the others. So they have very, very different mass mechanisms. And so understanding this will help us to understand uh, um, uh, the, the, the origin of, of mass of hadrons, which is one of our big goals for the EIC. Um, also, uh, the, the pion plays a critical role in long-range nucleon-nucleon interactions. It's the Yukawa particle carrier of the nuclear force, um, although our evidence for that has been difficult to find as well. Um, it also could be the origin of the uh, D-bar minus U-bar flavor asymmetry. Uh, so this um, is the 866 NUSI, where we have uh, we find that we have D-bar minus U-bar um, uh, at that time, surprising that we have a flavor asymmetry here. Um, very, very recently, just a, a week or a couple of weeks ago, um, Sequest came out. Um, so this new data from Sequest, uh, which uh, now uh, con confirms that nature prefers D-bar over U-bar in the proton C, um, a, a bit different at large X than we PDF fitters have been using uh, so far. So this is exciting and new to, to embrace the, the new Sequest data and see what we learn from that. Um, but uh, it, the data are consistent with um, with meson baryon model approaches. And so, uh, so the pion will play a key role here. Um, also, back to the primary topic um, I'm talking about is the pion PDFs themselves. They also play a role in nucleon and nuclear PDFs because the pion is always a part of the nucleon. When we're scattering off the nucleon, we are sometimes scattering off of a pion in the p-pi fluctuation or the n-pi minus fluctuation. And, and sometimes we're scattering off of uh, in the traditional nucleon. So it's all in the nucleon, but we could separate those two, right? And understand the nucleon structure at a whole new level by actually understanding the pion structure. 
So um, uh, we only we don't have many measurements to date. Um, we only have uh, tag DIS, actually the first tag DIS measurements from Hera, um, and then we have Pionic Drillian. Um, from E615 uh, on nuclei actually. And so Hera is in the higher Q lower X regime and this ha uh, and the Drillian has some higher X, but um, it's just two data sets and they're not um, overlapping and they're different and it's very difficult to get any kind of pion PDF from that, but you have to start somewhere. Um, so at the EIC, we can solve this problem. I believe we can do this kind of uh, Sullivan process tag DIS approach and create these pion targets, and we'll, we'll have good luminosity to do that. So what you're looking at here is a plot from the Hall-A pion Titus experiment, but what it's showing you is that the pion, pionic component of the proton is roughly three orders of magnitude down. So this is a function of T for different values of X, um, but it, we, we need to extrapolate T for every X point because we need to try to get back to the as close to the on shell as we can. So we need a range in X to do these measurements. But at any rate, the point is that we're three orders, 10 to the minus three, we're about three orders down, but um, the EIC is roughly three orders of magnitude more luminosity than Hera, plus we're going to have a, a very high detection fraction because we're aiming at this kind of tagged measurement. And so um, the hope is that the pion data from the EIC should be comparable to um, the proton data from Hera. And then also we have, of course, Amber at CERN coming up as well. So we will get uh, an abundant uh, new data set to really begin to aim at these pion PDFs. And so, um, like the plot I showed you before, you're looking at the uncertainty the, the uncertainty reduction in the parton distribution function of the hadron in this kind of plot, and you see it's down, um, you know, 70, 80 uh, percent. So, we're, so we're going to get very, very uh, good handle on these pion PDFs at large x. So let me return then back to DVEX, where I started out, this long-standing problem that we have, and one way that we can solve it is from tagged experiments at Jefferson Lab 12 and at the EIC, but um, that may not be the whole picture. And this is one of the great things about uh, fitting parton distribution functions is that we can do a global picture, right? These are fundamental things that um, cross multiple types of experiments. And so, um, so we can look at a global data set because not, everything has a plus and a minus. So we have data like um, <clears throat> asymmetries, uh, W and lepton asymmetries from D0 and CDF and RIC and LHCB. And these have direct sensitivity to the D distribution. They're at high W and Q. So nominally exactly everything you want. However, it is a relatively small data set. Over here, we have this deep and elastic deuterium data, as I said, 30 years of it. <laughs> so it's a very large body of data um, from multiple experiments with an extensive range in X and Q squared that you would like for evolution, but it requires deuteron nuclear corrections. And then we have the kind of data I was talking about, the bonus data, which gives you a nearly model independent neutron, um, uh, but it was obtained at 6 GeV and, and at 12 GeV, and until we have the EIC, we're sitting <coughs> not at the perfect um, high Q that we would like. And so no one of these is perfect, but put all together into a global fit, and we can begin to really get a handle on D of X, or look another way, we can actually use these other types of data to actually tell us what is the nuclear correction to deuterium, such that we can leverage this large body of deuterium data. And so um, CJ, we've done this recently, the CJ stands for CTEC Jefferson Lab, um, part-time distribution function fits, and these are aimed at uh, addressing high X. And so we incorporate higher twist and target mass, and um, we allow D over U to go to a constant and try to put in state-of-the-art deuteron nuclear corrections and the things one needs to do to get at that. <clears throat> but, um, uh, but, but the other approach is that you can now, uh, put in the state of the art or what you think the state of the art is for the Deuteron nuclear correction, but uh, you can see if it becomes in tension with this other global data set. Um, and we're trying to incorporate, like everybody, there's data coming in, so we're trying to incorporate a lot of data. Um, this is, for instance, looking at including um, uh, some of the star data from Rick in, into our data set as well um, to, again, reduce the uncertainties. The more information the and the more de-specific information, the better. But um, we can use that to to pull back out uh, what the deuteron should be. And so this is actually an F2N data set we recently um, 
uh, created. So this publication is in preparation, but uh, now we have F2N versus Q squared over uh, magnitudes in X and Q squared uh, because we've gone back and recorrected the world's Deuteron data set to create a neutron data set based on um, what we've learned from working in, in this high X regime uh, with CJ. Um, it does include the theoretical uncertainties associated with doing that. Um, so it, it has a, a larger error on it than the Deuteron, of course, but it's there for people to use. Um, another way is experimentally to try to reduce these uncertainties. So this is some first running at Jefferson Lab. Um, uh, we're all used to looking at scatter plots like this, which will show you in Q squared and in X where all of the data is, but it doesn't speak really to the uncertainty of the data, which also matters for extracting part-time distribution functions. And so this is um, Q squared and X uh, with uncertainty on this axis. And what you can see is that although there was large um, data, a large excuse me, high X and Q data from Slack and from NMC, um, much of it actually had very large uncertainties on it. And so one of the nice things about Jefferson Lab and the high luminosity is that we can run an experiment now at 12 Jev, like these red spots um, that you're seeing here, which are at high X, but also going out to fairly high Q squared around 15. And we can contribute high precision data where there was data, but it was not high precision data. And so this experiment ran, um, Again, pushing up an X and Q squared using the uh, existing high momentum spectrometer, but also the super high momentum spectrometer in Hall C at Jefferson Lab. Um, and what we, we do is we do a traditional scan and momentum to scan in X and Q. So we fix an angle and then we change the spectrometer momentum and move through X and Q. So this experiment was one of the first 12 Jev commissioning experiments. And so this is preliminary, actually near final data, publication draft is in preparation for this data. This is the D to H, deuterium to proton ratio um, coming from this experiment. And one thing I want to show you is that just the quality of the data, this is just one of these scans. There are multiple scans that there will be a large data set, but also um, we go all the way into the resonance region as we approach the highest X. And so um, we can look at, for instance, this nice Kulag and Petty hybrid model, which transitions from the DIS to the resonance region, um, an attempt to begin to actually get, get the mass states out, not just the, the DIS. So, so this is nice. And, and one can look at poor Cadron duality studies and things like that as well out here. So this data will be available quite soon. Um, this is, uh, it says preliminary, but I put a star there because it's actually, um, we're finalizing now. Um, okay. Sorry, Cynthia, you have uh, two minutes left. Oh, I do. I'm sorry. I thought I had five. Um, I'm going to rush then. I'm terribly sorry. Um, okay, so then I wanted to get through nuclei. So nuclei, we have the EMC effect, um, very familiar to all of you all. And I wanted to show that we've been doing uh, nuclear PDF work as well, uh, trying to begin a framework that we can use to get to the EIC. So uh, utilizing the CTEC framework, but putting in data at high X, which has traditionally been cut out um, due to the same kinds of reasons that was cut out from the proton PDFs, um, target mass corrections and Deuteron and so on. So we've been leveraging the CJ work to put into nuclear CTEC. Um, and so a lot of people have been making progress in nuclear PDFs. It's really been a, an exciting time for nuclear PDFs. A lot of good information coming out um, because I'm pressed for time. I won't talk too much about that, but I can say that the Deuteron corrections become important because a lot of the data leverage the A over D, F2 nucleus over F2 deuterium. Um, so one needs to be careful about that because some of the effect is coming from effects in deuterium. Uh, but I want to show you uh, data. So <laughs> this is a new Hall C experiment, um, uh, not, uh, which took some preliminary data. The experiment wishes to look at all of these nuclei, um, and that's what it's approved to do, uh, because we've... Uh, we uh, were surprised some time back by looking at nuclear density, uh, look at the size of the EMC effect as measured by this slope of this, uh, this part from X is 0.3 to 0.7, um, looking at that slope. And, and what you'll realize is that something like beryllium looks like helium-3, which was kind of surprising. And so is it that it beryllium has a shape like this? Um, you know, what you'd like to have to really map out what is going on is uh, low mass, high density, 
density, high mass, low density, low mass, low density, high mass, high density, right? And be able to fix one of those things and move the other, uh, fix another one, move the other. And so you need an array of nuclei. And so that's what we're gonna measure actually. And we began to do that. So we uh, pulled just this part for the commissioning experiments in Hall C. And so these are preliminary data on boron 10 and 11. So here, of course, we're gonna look at what happens in the night light nuclei when we have an additional nucleon. Um, this is preliminary. We're still looking at the systematic uncertainties, but this data should be coming out and available to everybody quite soon. Also, um, we took carbon. Um, so, of course, we'll do nuclear effects at the EIC, uh, nuclear proton distribution function. So this is just a plot from the yellow report, and I'll just point out the, the reduction uh, uh, largely at, at more at low X than at high X, but again, we're on um, uh, log scales in this plot, but also uh, uh, really being able to uh, leverage the, uh, the theory that you can use at high X for the, that we're setting up is very important. And I think we're gonna get larger reductions personally. All right, then I wanna quickly show one other thing and I will, I will zip and stop one. I'm sorry, I really uh, thought I had a little bit more time. So, um, so uh, one can say, okay, we've had all these trouble trying to get the, the D over U from the nucleon. A nuclear physicist approach is to just, well, add more nucleons. <laughs> so uh, we ran this experiment as well. And what we said is to look at the mirror nuclei, uh, tritium and helium three. Uh, and so we're gonna take three nucleons, but they're mirror nuclei. And so the idea here is, um, if we're relying only on not the nuclear effects in either one of these nuclei, but the difference in the nuclear effects between the two. So we take a super ratio of the mirror nuclei to get at looking at the N over P ratio, which will get us to the, the D over U uh, PDF ratio. So, um, uh, Tritium, uh, H3, is uh, not a trivial thing to bring into a, a DOE lab. Uh, this was the first time one was used in over three decades for nuclear physics, a tour de force by this experiment, but it worked wonderfully, actually. And this is final results. You will see this, you're seeing it now, and these will be available, submitted to PRL this week. Um, so this is hot off the press. So this is uh, F2N over F2P as a function of X. Um, and this blue uh, circles are the new data coming from the marathon experiment, which is the ratio of tritium and helium three. Um, and it's also already being used, for instance, by the JAM collaboration. So that's Jefferson Angular Momentum, who do this simultaneous extraction of PDFs, spin dependent, non-spin dependent, um, also fragmentation functions in a Monte Carlo framework. So a very, very ambitious collaboration and uh, looking at what would DOU look like from this data set. So, um, so it's already coming out. And I'm just going to quickly say that we also have polarized. So all of those predictions that we had for unpolarized N over P, you have for delta U over delta D and A1N. And in Hall C, we also put in a polarized helium-3 target, which creates a polarized neutron. And so we did a, here's his pictures of how the target sits in the hall, the same HMS and SHMS I showed you before. And here's photos of the target and our happy uh, students and postdocs working on, on the target uh, in the hall. And uh, we will have A1N data coming out. This is data in the can. We ran this experiment in 2020. Um, and uh, this, again, in that picture of combining with multiple other experiments, um, we can combine, for instance, with A1P, and we can get out delta U and delta D at, in this high X regime in a global PDF framework such as JAM. Um, so near-term status, um, JLab12 has run all of these experiments. Their data in the can, done. We've taken all of this new large X data. There's also dedicated theory efforts underway, both for um, <clears throat> polarized and unpolarized nuclear and nucleon. Um, also, as a community, we have the Sequest experiment now, as well as the ability to use um, W and other asymmetry data from LHC and RIC. So we should all expect very large improvements in our understanding of the large X valence regime in the next just one to two years, right? We're not waiting five, six, um, you know, I'm not showing experiments that are proposed and someday we're gonna run it. This is data in the can and people are using it and theorists are using it. So it's quite an exciting time for the large X regime. But of course, it's even more exciting because that's the tip of the iceberg and we have the EIC coming. So there's there's more, right? We're gonna be able to do all of this, but do it at high Q which and, and, and have a range in Q and X, which is what we really want for extracting the 
part on distribution functions. And I didn't talk about a whole bunch of opportunities there um, and, and not even about moving on to, to three-dimensional structure. Um, but, uh, but so thank you. And thanks to everyone. I got plots from all of these people um, and, uh, <laughs> and more. So it's, it took a village because uh, it's a lot of experiments and a lot of new data. So, so thank you all for listening and thank all of you who, who helped me to make plots. Great. Thank you very much, Cynthia, for this very nice talk. So uh, I think that Abba is monitoring uh, who had some questions. So maybe Abba, you, you want to cut out the first, first question? Yeah, people can use the reaction tab at the bottom to raise their hands. If there are hands raised, if you have questions for Cynthia, please go ahead. One more minute. Oh. There is a question from Aaron. Aaron, go ahead. Yes. Aaron, unmute yourself. You're muted, Aaron. You have to unmute first. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, I'll start with a general question. Um, you had quite a lot of data with low Q squared. And I wanted to ask you at what Q squared are we allowed to talk about partons? So um, I think I think we're all, all, <laughs> I, I should defer to theorists, but I'll tell you my personal approach um, is I think we're allowed to talk about partons wherever we want, but we need to be extremely cautious. Um, you know, even at Jefferson Lab, we're now at 12 Jeb, we're approaching for some of these experiments, Q squared's 15 or so at, you know, X is 0.7 or so. But, um, but even there, you know, we need to be aware that we may have large um, non-perturbative effects. Um, we could have target mass, um, for instance, we could have higher twist. And so we need to bring those in. That's why I was um, hopefully uh, emphasizing the, the extremely valuable role that the theorists who are working into this regime are playing, because we we need to be able to have a handle on that as well. And then hopefully as we move to higher and higher Q squared, for instance, with the EIC, we will be able to see those effects um, drop off or change in the way that we expect them to. to, to. So we will also learn about non-perturbative QCD as, as, we, as we move forward. But I, I, I believe that we can talk about all of that within the context of the parton distribution functions. We can talk about nuclei, we can talk about nuclear effects and that's a non-perturbative QCD effect. And so we, we learn more when we do that, but it's, it's quite a challenge. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. I don't see one. Go ahead. Okay, so then we then we, we should thank Cynthia again for his very nice uh, her very nice talk, and then we move to the next speaker of today's uh, plenary session, who is Emanuela Barberis from Northwestern University. I can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, and then maybe you can try to share your slides. Let me. I think you should, you should go to full screen now. Yeah, yeah. Let's see, can you see? It's not really full screen, it's still like cropped. Strange. So we, we see the PDF uh, application, not the, the full screen. Yes. 
I think so, yeah. Like, like we, we can still see the the upper and bottom panel with the icons, but that's I think, so I think that's fine, yeah. So oh, you have so as opposed to what I said yeah before, so you have uh, 25 minutes and then we have uh, 10 minutes for questions. So I will give you a warning five minutes before. So okay. thank you very much and the, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I, I'm going to discuss recent highlights on uh, QCD Electroweek and Top Physics from the LHC collaborations, Atlas MS and uh, um, LHCB. And, uh, um, Sorry, this is actually not working for some reason. I'm actually doing that. Yes, that's perfect. It doesn't let me advance. And this is actually the first time that has happened to me. So it, it, it works fine now. C can you just uh, move the slides? I can't. Okay. That's the problem. That's a problem. Yeah. So if, if, if not, we have, okay, we can, can you try now, switch slides? No, it's not advancing. Okay, so we'll, we have your talk downloaded. So if you yeah. stop sharing, maybe we can share it uh, for you. Yeah. It's fine. Okay, then, you know. Nif, if you can, sh if you can share Emmanuel as a slide, then. Yes. Okay, now full screen. Is, is it possible to go full screen? Or this is, this is the best we can do. I'm trying to do that. Um, or else I can just show it this way. Um, if that yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I, I think we need to move forward. So maybe this is the, the best option. In any case, the slides are online. So I propose that we start this way. So Emanuela, you know, whenever you want. And then All you... right. So I'll just see next when, uh, when we need to go. So I already, uh, let's go to the next. Thank you. So I am going to uh, give um, a few highlights and uh, on most recent results, uh, um, really from the collaborations uh, on uh, JET and uh, um, Photon Productions, WZ Production, and then Vector Boson, um, WZ Gamma Plus Jets, uh, uh, then to Multi Boson Top Coat Production. So the, the disclaimer is that uh, we have uh, a, a huge amount of, uh, of new results coming from uh, the LHC on these topics. Uh, so this is an incomplete uh, list of topics and uh, uh, we, which is skewed towards the most uh, recent results. There are many more results and even on these ones, there will be more details, um, which will be discussed in the parallel session. So please uh, stay tuned for the talks in the parallel sessions. Next, please. So in terms of data taking, we are analyzing and, and producing results on the full uh, run two data sets right now, um, which concluded in uh, 2018. And uh, what I would like to emphasize here that is that really we, we are starting a, a paradigm of uh, uh, precision physics in Electroweek and uh, QCD. So you, you see many results which are appearing with different techniques, different ideas. Um, and we are really approaching 
precision in many corners of parameter uh, space, uh, which will continue through RAN3, which will start in 2022, um, and then uh, eventually uh, to the future with the uh, high luminosity LHC. Next, please. So in terms of standard model physics, this is a very, very broad range of measurements that covers uh, you know, uh, nine order of magnitude in cross sections. Um, since we are doing precision measurements in, in many respects, in many uh, areas, these measurements are sensitive also to uh, new physics and uh, they, they constrain and look for new physics in, uh, in indirect ways. There are also backgrounds to all of uh, the complementary direct searches for uh, new physics. So you see here uh, measurements of cross sections in uh, single boson, diboson, tribosons, uh, uh, and more rare production mechanism than top and Higgs, which will be covered in the next talk. Next, please. So let's start with, uh, with jet physics and with the inclusive jet cross sections, which at the LHC are performed double differentially in transverse momentum and rapidity. And they are measured in, uh, in many regimes in, in kinematic uh, regions and compared to fixed order calculations and uh, uh, Monte Carlo predictions. Um, they are sensitive, of course, to PDFs. And uh, uh, their studies in multiple ways and multiple regions helps us uh, uh, understand what uh, is the best modeling of all perturbative and non-perturbative effects. So in here is a recent result on the dependence of the jet inclusive cross-section on basically the jet size in rapidity and azimuth, the parameter, distant parameter uh, R of the KT algorithm. So in here, we studied the dependence um, as a function of transverse momentum, as a function of R, and R is sensitive to various components of the evolution of partons into jets, uh, non-perturbative effects um, from parton shower adronization and underlying event. So we see that uh, uh, in, in certain region of uh, perimeter space, um, uh, we have better modeling from uh, um, different uh, uh, generators, but in general, parton shower calculations agree well with data. We, you know, this is a, a common conclusion to all the measurements. We need uh, higher order corrections. Um, on uh, top of uh, flipping order. And uh, uh, the accurate modeling of non-perturbative effects is essential. Next, please. Uh, going beyond uh, inclusive, uh, we look at multi-jet uh, um, cross-section differential, um, the correlations among uh, angles of jets and the shapes. And these measurements are also sensitive to the modeling of radiative processes. So here are normalized differential cross sections um, as a function of angular separation uh, between the second and third leading jet and the uh, uh, transverse momentum ratio of these two jets for three jet events and Z plus two jet events. And different uh, configuration are studied to probe different types and details of radiation, large and small angle or soft and hard um, angle here. So um, the diagram shows the different configuration, different regions of delta R, different regions of uh, uh, momentum ratio are sensitive to different effects. And again, uh, um, here we need high order corrections and, uh, um, and this gives us some insight on the modeling of pattern shower as well. Let's go to the next, where we uh, study event shapes. And this uh, is again in multi-jet events. And this is uh, uh, basically studying um, variables which traditionally typically are uh, uh, correlated to the properties of, uh, of uh, shapes, uh, which are uh, thrust, uh, sphericity, and planarity. Um, which are studied here, the normalized uh, shape of observables. And you can see from this measurement that, that there is really no prediction that produces the data well. So these are really important measurements that help us tune our uh, Monte Carlo um, simulations. So this gives us uh, um, hints um, on uh, the type of uh, parton shower which is uh, best modeling the, the data. So let's go to the next. Next slides, we can also look at jets with uh, a heavy flavor content. So this is a result from LHCB 
in die jet production of BBOR and CCBOR jet um, originated jets in the forward region as a function of leading transverse momentum and eta and rapidity between the jets. And also the die jet mass, which is an important observable for searches. So uh, the heavy flavor here are tagged like in a subsequent analysis with algorithms which are based on the reconstruction of secondary vertices and then the BNC jets are separated with uh, boosted de um, decision trees with multivariate algorithm, which is again typical. So in here, uh, the cross-sections are measured separately and as ratio and found to be in agreement with predictions. Next, please. A little bit more inside the uh, mechanism of production of jets. Um, now, in uh, at the LHC, uh, in the in, for several years now, we have uh, been using observable which are related to the jet structure, um, not only to study high mass resonances which decay hadronically, but also to study the formation of jets. So. In this analysis, gluon and quark initiated jets are identified via those observables and uh, I, they are isolated in either in uh, um, gluon and quark enriched regions. Uh, so respectively in multi-jet production, di-jet production and in Z plus jets. And then with the aid of a uh, um, substructure observable, this generalized angularity, which are uh, uh, comprise uh, thrust and width and, uh, and other similar uh, variables, we can look at the shapes of uh, this gluon and quark originated uh, data compared to predictions, uh, shape and normalization. So in general, shapes are well simulated, but we see that in the, uh, in the ratio of quark and gluon, um, there is an overestimation by the by newer simulation and tunes, which will require some improvement in the future. Next, please. Another way to use jet substructure to study jet formation and, and, uh, and uh, a pattern of uh, radiations at different physical effects is via the loon jet plane shown in here. Um, which is defined by variables that characterize uh, uh, the relative energy and angle of each emission. So different physical effects are localized in specific regions of this plane. So looking at slices in this plane, um, you can separate uh, different effects and, and study how well they are simulated. So for example, in here, you can zoom into uh, regions where wide angle parton showering effects are more important or collinear emission are more important. So through these lights, one can see how well the effects are uh, simulated. And uh, right now there is no prediction that reproduces the data full uh, well in the full uh, phase space, although there are certainly um, the generators that uh, um, do a better description um, across uh, the plane, which in this case is her week 71.3 with the angle order pattern shower. Next, please. We can also look at double parton scattering in jets. And this is done in inclusive for jet uh, production and uh, looking at uh, uh, angular correlations which are sensitive to the DPS uh, process. So here we can do a comparison of uh, uh, normalized uh, uh, distributions and also from one of the variables the, which is least sensitive to parton shower effect, we can uh, extract uh, uh, DPS uh, cross section and we can also extract this uh, sigma efficient uh, effective, which is uh, reflective of the correlation among the single processes that uh, um, overlap to give the DPS and is also quite sensitive to the modeling. Next, please. Uh, one intermediate results in going from jets to uh, Drelian via photons is photon fusion here with a forward proton tagged in the uh, forward proton spectrum spectrometer of Atlas. So this is a, a photon uh, fusion observation and cross section, um, which is a probe and test of uh, uh, QED. 
and uh, uh, it's done by requiring a proton, one at least one proton tagged uh, by uh, the forward spectrometer. The, the uh, final state is uh, dilepton opposite charge pairs um, with the proton and the fiducial cross-section uh, is measured here in agreement with uh, predictions. So let's move it to uh, Drelian and uh, W production. Next, please. These are sensitive processes to the electroweak QCD sectors, uh, the standard model. Uh, they are typically done with a very high precision in the leptonic uh, spectrum, as uh, shown on the left. Uh, this is a spectrum of uh, dilepton uh, transverse momentum. Um, there will be uh, newer uh, results on this side in, in slices of uh, dilepton mass that will be shown in the parallel uh, sessions. In addition to leptonic decays, which we can do with high precision, we are also exploring rare decays. So an example here is the decay of a W into a pi and gamma. So this is exclusive, exclusive decays where we can measure average Thing in the final state. So we are getting to measure the branching ratio of production of these rare decays. Uh, next, please. Uh, so on, as well on the Z production, in addition to the leptonic decays, we are now measuring uh, more challenging final states. And this is a Z going to neutrino, invisible decays which is an important background to searches such as dark matter monozy searches, monojet searches. So in combination, this is not impo only important to, to measure by itself, but this in combination with the leptonic decays gives us the most precise measurement of the spectrum of the Drerian um, PT, which is in, uh, in agreement with uh, simulations with uh, the, the highest orders that we can obtain. Next, please. So a new result this year um, is the measurement of branching fractions of uh, the W, uh, which is a test of lepton universalities. The W uh, are um, selected from the case of uh, TT bar, and the decay channels are categorized by lepton flavor and number of jets and B jets. Um, the, not only the leptonic branching fractions are measured, but also the hadronic ones are reported with or without assuming uh, lepton universalities. They are shown in here. The results are consistent with lepton universalities and consistent with uh, this is a CMS result, so they are consistent with previous atlas um, results of the um, ratio of tau to mu. These results exceed the lep precision. So, from also from the leptonic hadronic ratios, uh, uh, we extract three standard model quantities with certain assumptions uh, which are related to the CKM matrix elements and the measurement of alpha strong at the W mass. Next, please. So let's uh, come to some measurements of uh, vector boson association with jets. This is a measurement of Z and photon plus jets and the ratio. The ratio in particular is sensitive to higher order electroweak correction and high PT. And through all of these precision measurements, especially you know, in, the, in the V plus jets um, era, uh, area, we get to very high uh, transverse momentum. So we are really getting to a region where electroweak uh, um, corrections are important. So uh, we, we see the cross sections, differential cross sections uh, model well by uh, higher order corrections, good agreement. We measure the ratio and also. Um, we look at the topology of collinear emission of a Z boson, um, which is uh, shown in uh, here in the uh, lower right. And it's the first time that we um, study this topology on Z bosons we have done previously on Ws. Next, please. We can also study vector boson in association with heavy flavors. So I'm going to show here briefly production uh, of uh, Z plus C and also Z plus one or two Bs. Z plus C is sensitive to the charm content. Um, the differential cross section are, are extracted here as a function of uh, uh, transverse momentum of the Z from uh, um, a fit to the invariant mass of the tracks associated with the secondary vertex. So the findings are, you know, good. Uh, um, 
good reproduction of the shape, but uh, uh, overall uh, normalization, which is uh, overestimated, uh, leading perhaps to um, a uh, overestimate of the PDFs in the charm content. Next, next uh, let's go to Z plus uh, one or two Bs. This uh, is a um, next slide, please. It's a very comprehensive measurement of uh, a differential cross-section of Z plus one or two Bs, which are sensitive to gluon splitting and can probe the B-quark PDF. This, uh, uh, this mechanism is also sensitive to the flavor scheme. So here, the cross-sections are uh, measure fiducial and differential in many, many variables, which are uh, a function of kinematics and angular correlations of the Z and the Bs. Um, and uh, shown in here are a couple of uh, just of distributions. Uh, in general, best agreement of the data is with the uh, um, five flavor uh, scheme at, uh, at NLO. Next, please. Um, we also look at uh, double, double parton scattering in Z plus jets uh, using um, similar variables which are sensitive to this process as the ones that were used in the four inclusive jet. And uh, this is again a comprehensive study of normalized distributions that will help us uh, disentangle uh, and, and tune uh, the simulation for this process. And uh, so again, there is no single prediction that fits the overall uh, spectrum and uh, the measurements are significantly sensitive to non-perturbative effects. Next, please. I'm going to transition now to multiboson production. This has been really a very, very active area for the LHC um, experiments in terms of uh, uh, measuring with precision uh, multiboson production processes, but also reaching uh, rare processes with an increased pre you know, precision. These are really uh, tests of the uh, gauge structure of the standard model. And they are sensitive in the high uh, transverse momentum tail to uh, um, physics beyond the standard model effects via anomalous vector boson coupling. So all of these processes, most of them are being analyzed now in the con context of uh, effective field theory, looking for dimension six, dimension eight anomalous uh, you know, operators. So let, uh, these are you know, the, the, the summary plots from uh, CMS and ATLAS in some in diboson and triboson, but uh, let's review some of the most recent measurements. Next, please. Emanuela, you, you yeah. have five, five minutes left. Wow. All right, WC production, this is an, in, incredibly comprehensive result of WZ production in leptonic final states that includes uh, total differential cross-section, charge asymmetry measurements, uh, search for anomalous trilinear gauge couplings, and polarization. First observation of longitudinal polarized W in WZ. Again, the, uh, the, the, the distributions of uh, cross-sections are in best agreement with matrix. Most of these uh, uh, processes are compared to matrix and NLO QCD and NLO electroweak. Next, please. This is a measurement that covers several production mechanisms for leptons in the final state. It covers uh, uh, the case of ZZ, ZH, and other uh, minor ones. It leads to the most precise measurement of Z to four Ls and is also used uh, um, in an EFT analysis to place constraints on uh, um, new physics um, um, operators. Next, please. Uh, we have also studied the W gamma production in quite uh, detail, the measured as a double differential cross section in photon PT and angular observables. Uh, this is used to set constraints on anomalous uh, W gamma couplings via a novel EFT technique, uh, which is linked here, which leads to enhanced sensitivity in standard model dimension six interference operators, which are shown in the middle. Next, please. Notice that all of these are now differential measurements. Another astounding um, measurement in terms of precision is uh, this uh, WW plus jets, where we have now 10% precision in the phase space, which is uh, uh, quite extreme, is, uh, is a um, high jet PT. 
cut above 200 GV. So these are differential distributions in good agreement with predictions and distributions. Um, yeah, um, again, the measurement is astounding in this uh, previously unexplored event topology. Next, please. Now to bridge uh, the measurements between LHC and the Tevatron, um, the boson production is also measured at 5 TB in agreement with predictions. Next, please. And let me just give two uh, examples of uh, vector boson scattering, electric production of uh, uh, Zs with forward jets. On the left is a Z gamma plus jets from CMS. And on the right is a, a four lepton ZZ uh, jet, jet from Atlas, all exceeding five sigma significance. Next, please. An example of triboson, which is a rare production. Uh, this is the first measurement of V gamma gamma production at 13 TB, W gamma gamma and Z gamma gamma. It's a rare process, which is now pro uh, studied differentially. The cross sections are here in agreement. Uh, with the NELO predictions and constraints on anomalous couplings are also extracted from the spectrum. Next, please. All right, um, observation of a WW as uh, opposite uh, uh, sign, a photo induced production. Uh, the first observation, again, this is uh, production sensitive to the gauge structure of the standard model. The cross section is measured, the significance is, uh, is very high and uh, good agreement with predictions. These will also go as input to an EFT interpretation soon. Next. All right, let me finish with uh, a, a, um, another dye boson before uh, switching to top. Uh, Measurement, this is looking at polarized uh, scattering of same sign WW, very important because this amplitude uh, um, restores unitarities and is, uh, is uh, driven by, by the Higgs boson here. So we have looked for electroweak production um, of same sign and uh, um, measure um, the production with at least one longitudinal W, which is what we want to study here uh, with 2.3 sigma significance. Next, please. So let me get and finish with uh, uh, some top work physics results. Uh, LHC is a top factory, precision physics for top. All the per production results are in excellent agreement with NNLO and NNLL theory, including the newest production uh, measurements at five or two um, tera electron volts, which are bridging uh, LHC and Tevatron measurements here from CMS and Atlas. Next. The cross section for per production is also measured differentially. And this is again another extremely comprehensive um, paper of differential cross sections in all uh, uh, different kinematic variables that combines for the first time resolved and boosted um, submerged so jets into uh, in the final state of the lepton plus jets. Um, so comparisons are made here um, and uh, um, in, in generally well described by uh, uh, higher order corrections, um, fixed order calculations and generators. Uh, and you can see deviations in uh, several instances. For example, the top quark PT spectrum is observed in comparison uh, to most of the NLO predictions to be softer. Next one. This is a, a single top production, electroweak single top uh, production, which is uh, measured in many decay channels. The latest one is uh, uh, in the production of uh, T and W in the semi-leptonic decay. Top is also measured. Um, here, the mass of the top is also measured uh, um, in single top production, uh, separately for top and anti-top in order to test CPT invariance, uh, and is shown in here in the bottom, which is uh, the measurements are consistent uh, with each other for top and anti-top. Next one, I will conclude with some associated production of uh, top. 
um, which uh, gives a direct probe into uh, the top core couplings and that can be modified by physics beyond the standard model. So the measurements are uh, reaching a greater precision and they are going into uh, EFT interpretation. So on the left, we have TTZ, inclusive differential measurement. In the, on the right, we have TT gamma, again, inclusive a differential measurement, but also as input to uh, um, EFT analysis uh, that constrains anomalous couplings. On the next, uh, on the next and last uh, slide, uh, let me uh, discuss a very rare uh, top process, which is the production of four tops, uh, and which is very sensitive to new physics, high mass scalars, for example, and top you cover coupling. So these are uh, some of the most recent searches um, that uh, uh, focus on IJET uh, and BJET multiplicity. They use uh, multivariate techniques to extract uh, the signal. And the signal is extracted with a significance here of uh, you know, approaching five sigma. So the cross-section is compatible with the standard model precisions. So next, and in conclusion, next slide, please. Um, the, the breadth of standard model measurements, electroweak QCD and top corps coming out of the LHC is now impressive. It uh, depends and challenges our understanding of electroweak interactions and their modeling. And it's really uh, you know, cutting into an era of precision physics where uh, these increase, increasingly more precise and complex standard model measurements are uh, uh, sort of dominating uh, in constraining um, new physics uh, um, over dedicated searches. Um, so there will be more to come and uh, um, please stay tuned to uh, the collaborations pages and the discussion of uh, results more in detail in the parallel sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emanuela, for this very comprehensive talk. So if anyone has questions, please raise your hand. Paul? Hi, Emmanuel. Thank you. So, so it's a question about double parton scattering, which mm -hmm. is slide 11. So, so on slide 11, you, you, you wrote that the, the, using this sigma effective, um, yeah. sigma effective depends on the model that you use. I mean, I, I guess it also depends on the process. Yeah. So, so, so do we conclude that it's just too much of a simplification to try and describe it all in terms of one effective cross section or, or something else? I, I, that's a very good question and I don't really have the answer for it. Uh, it's uh, in a way it's a, it's a correlation, a measurement of correlation. So it really, it depends on the model. So I, you know, it's not an absolute parameter. It really depends on how you model your correlation. Right. So it's not a universal parameter. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, you know, we, we try to, I think the experiments try to give, uh, you know, a fair representation of, of what is the number extracted different, under different assumptions. Okay, thanks. This is a tricky measurement. Yeah. Thank you. We also have a question from Pavel. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, can you please go to slide 31? I'm sorry, 531? 31. 31. 31. Slide 31. Sorry. Yes, this one. Yeah. Uh, so uh, how are correlations between the various uh, differential distributions um, are, are included on the right hand side? In other words, is there any theoretical calculation that agrees with all distributions at once for the same systematic shifts in the data? I don't believe so. Okay, so, so you compare one, one distribution at a time. No, no, they, they are all, uh, they are correlated. So I, I mean, I, I'm not sure. It, there are deviations from observed for, uh, I think, every single uh, predictions. And uh, 
most of the deviations are in the torque quark PT spectrum and in probably in some corners of, uh, of the um, angular variables. Okay, thank you. So one thing I, I should mention is that this, this massive production of differential cross-sections, uh, the, the aim of the experiments is uh, to put everything in HEP data, right? With the correlations, with the, all the matrices of correlations, because there is so much more that the theory community can do in, in comparing and tuning uh, or calculations. Yeah, absolutely, these are very important measurements. Yeah. We yeah. do need to know these correlations, yes. Okay, thank you very much. I think that we need to move to the next speaker. So thanks, Emanuela, for this very thank nice you. talk. So the next speaker is Charlotte Van Halsen. Uh, Charlotte, can you please try to share your slides? Do you see that? Yes, and now try to go full screen. Okay. Yes, it's, per okay. it's perfect. So you, you, you have 25 minutes and I'll give you a warning after uh, 20 minutes. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present uh, QCD and hadronic uh, final state. So I will show your results on heavy quark and flavor production from the LHC and RIC. So I'll start by giving you an result, showing your results on open flavor production. Then I'll show you results on quarkonium production, both in inclusive and exclusive processes. And then I'll end with results on spectroscopy. So when uh, performing measurements in hadron hadron uh, collisions. The advantage of looking at charm and beauty production is uh, the large mass of the B and C quarks, and this large mass provides us a hard scale so that we can apply perturbative uh, QCD and as such we can actually, by looking at charm and beauty production, probe uh, the nucleon or uh, nuclei. Also, because of their very uh, heavy mass, the B and C quarks are generally produced at the beginning of the interaction. And looking at charm and beauty production, we can then actually investigate the interaction of uh, the partons with the nucleon and the nuclear medium. Now, as you all know, when we consider charm and beauty production in hadron uh, hadron collisions, we have three elements. We have the Barton distribution functions, which are non perturbative and which we constrain through data. Then we have the hard Barton scattering um, that we can calculate. And finally, we have the fragmentation of uh, the B and C quarks. And both the PDFs and the collinear fragmentation functions are generally considered to uh, be universal, so they are considered to be the same if we extract them from measurements in EP, scattering E plus E minus annihilation or hadron, hadron collisions. So I'll start by showing your results in a D meson production in proton-proton collisions at 13 TeV by uh, the CMS experiment. And here you see the cross sections as a function of transverse momentum for the different uh, D mesons and overlaid on the data points, you see predictions from uh, models and calculations. And in the bottom, you see the ratio of theory compared to data. And you see that overall, um, the simulations describe the data relatively well, but none is really capable of describing the kinematic behavior over the full PT range. Uh, here now I'll show you results from Alice in proton-proton interactions at 5 TV. And now we look at the ratio of D plus compared to D zero as a function of transverse momentum, both for prompt production and for non-prompt production. So D is coming from B decay. And the advantage of looking at ratios is that you're sensitive to the fragmentation of the C to C quark to the D meson only. And you see here that this ratio is uh, constant as a function of transverse momentum. Now here on the right, I can show you results from Alice at 5 TV, but now we look at the ratio of lambda C plus compared to D0 as a function of transverse momentum. And these measurements are taken at uh, 5 TV in PP collisions and they complement earlier measurements uh, from Alice at 7 TV, but now with much higher precision. And what you see here is that um, the ratio, sorry, um, yeah. 
you see here that the ratio uh, decreases as a function of uh, transverse momentum. This behavior was already hinted at with the 7TV data, but couldn't be confirmed due to lack of uh, precision. But now we see really see a clear uh, decrease of the ratio um, with increasing PT. And the same behavior is actually observed also in uh, uh, light hadrons. So this really suggests that there is a difference between the fragmentation into mesons and into baryons. In addition, if we compare uh, the data with different model calculations, then uh, considering, the, considering the lower two model calculations, they include only the fragmentation of your C quark to your uh, final state baryon, where the parameters are tuned using E plus E minus annihilation data and EP scattering data. And you see that these models actually do not describe the data as, at all. But if we include, in addition to DC uh, to lambda fragmentation, also uh, more complicated processes such as uh, the recombination of uh, soft partons to create your final state, then uh, we see that these models do manage to uh, describe the data. And such um, the discrepancy between fragmentation described in uh, E plus E minus and EP and the one from hadron hadron collisions was actually also already observed uh, in the measurement of absolute cross sections and also in the beauty uh, sector. So it is really suggests that this more complicated QCD environment of hadron-hadron collisions does influence uh, the fragmentation process. Now, here you see uh, results uh, sensitive to the fragmentation of uh, Peak works from ATLAS uh, in proton proton collisions at 13 TV. And ATLAS looked at uh, B hadrons in jets from a sample of uh, TT bar. So they looked at uh, events where they had two jets containing uh, B hadrons and then a muon and uh, electron of opposite charge. These uh, measurements complement the existing measurements in E plus E minus annihilation sensitive to the fragmentation of B quarks. But here now we look at a B quark that is color connected to a top quark, whereas in E plus E minus annihilation, your B quark comes from a color singlet, uh, which is a virtual photon or the Z boson. Now again, with these measurements from ATLAS, we are sensitive to this more complicated QCD environment. And uh, ATLAS, um, extracted the measurements uh, for three classes of variables. So the first class of variables uh, concerns the uh, total momentum of the charged uh, BDK components compared to the total momentum of the charged jet components, both looking at the transverse and uh, the transverse component and the component along the uh, jet axis. And these variables are sensitive to a uh, small angle gluon radiation of your B hadron just before it hadronizes. Then the other variable is, uh, again, the transverse component of your charge B decay products compared now to the transverse uh, momentum component of your electron and your muon. And here you probe actually radiation in the decay of your top quark. And finally, it also considered the number of uh, stable charge uh, decay products, which gives you a handle on uh, the type of B hadrons that were produced and the branching fractions. And here on the left, you see the results for the different uh, variables extracted from the measurements. And on top of the uh, black data points, you see also Monte Carlo simulations. And in the bottom, you see each time the ratios of uh, data and, and uh, predictions. And you see actually that here the Monte Carlo does describe the data uh, rather well. Now I go over to inclusive quarkonium production. So um, quarkonium production by itself is interesting to probe nucleons and nuclei, but there is no consensus yet on how quarkonia are uh, produced. The general common assumption though is that there is a factorization between the production of your heavy QQ bar pair and the hadronization of your heavy QQ bar pair into a final state quarkonium. And the different models differ in their approach of how they uh, uh, model this uh, hadronization of your heavy QQ bar pair. And one of the often used models is a non-relativistic QCD, which considers uh, in general two components, which are the color singlet here depicted on the left, where you have your uh, um, color singlet QQ bar state that already has a, all the right quantum numbers and then just evolves into a final state quarkonium. And then you also have a contribution from the color octet state where you have a non-color neutral QQ bar state with quantum numbers that differ from your final state 
quarkonium, and then through gluon radiation, this QQ bar state evolves into your final state quarkonium. Now, this uh, evolution of your QQ bar state into a final quarkonium state is described uh, by long distance matrix elements, which are non perturbative, and we extract them from data, but some nice features is that they're considered to be universal, regardless of uh, the production of your quarkonium bead from BDK or prompt production. And uh, if we assume heavy quark symmetry, we can also relate LDMEs for from different quarkonia to each other. So there are models that meant to describe uh, quarkonium production, like the kinematic behavior, but uh, it's very hard to, at the same time, uh, for example, describe polarization. So in general, in order to understand quarkonium products, we need a lot of different types of measurements, so at different center of mass energies, covering, of course, a large range in PT and rapidity. Uh, again, we can compare different quarkonium states that can help us, and we also should um, provide measurements on polarization. So here you first see a quarkonium production proton-proton collision on top left for JPSI for the Phoenix experiment at forward rapidity, where you see the cross section um, as a function of transverse momentum. Uh, Phoenix also has recent results uh, at mid rapidity, which are shown here by the second data point uh, on the left. And this is uh, overlaid with results from other experiments at a different center of mass energies. And it's nice here to see that the cross section as a logarithmic dependence on the center of mass energy. And this can be included uh, when one is building models. On the bottom left, you see results from STAR at the 500 GeV in proton-proton collisions for epsilon production. So in green, you have the epsilon 1s uh, cross-section, and then the blue points are the 2s and 3s combined. And you see that this cross-section doesn't have an s steep dependence on transverse momentum as j does. Then there are a whole series of recent LHC results, uh, but let me highlight the one from LHCB, where they looked at uh, prompt ETA-C production. Um, and it's very nice to look at ETA-C production because through this heavy quark spin symmetry, the LDMEs of the ETA-C can be related to the ones of uh, the JPSI. And thus, what you can do is you can, using the existing JPSI data, build models and see if these models indeed predict the data that we see here for ETA-C or vice versa, you can use the new measurements on ETA-C to constrain uh, JPSI production. And you see here the cross-section as a function of transverse momentum and integrated over transverse momentum, this cross-section is uh, compatible with uh, production of ETA-C solely through the color singlet mechanism, but comparing the slopes in ETA-C and JPSI production, um, this would actually suggest that you also have a contribution from the uh, color octet. Now, uh, we can also look at uh, quarkonium production in uh, proton lead collisions, which of course can teach us something about the nuclear environment, but vice versa, also the interaction with the nuclear environment can teach us something about the production mechanism of um, quarkonia. And on the top left here, you see the cross section of psi 2s compared to j psi in proton lead collisions compared to proton proton collisions. And what you see is that there is a dependence uh, depending on the rapidity. Now, if you look on the right here, we have again a comparison between the 2s and 1s state, but now in the bottomonium sector. And if you look at the lower panel of the first figure there, you see again the cross section of um, in lead proton compared to proton proton production of uh, epsilon 2s compared to epsilon 1s as given by the blue point. And you see here, contrary to the J psi psi 2s case that there is no dependence on rapidity. For the epsilon 3s, uh, the data points are have a, a bit too large uncertainty to conclude anything. And you would have this draw the same conclusion uh, looking at the CMS results on the bottom. And then now looking on the bottom left plot, you see here the cross-section uh, ratios of Chi-C2 compared to Chi-C1, which is a P-wave termonium. And here you see the results in yellow for proton-proton collisions, and the other colors are the ones in uh, proton lead. Um, and if you would take the ratio also here, though, you would see no dependence on rapidity. So again, all these type of data can help us to constrain um, termonium production. 
Then let me end uh, this section with uh, showing you results on the polarization of thermonium production. So what you do in order to access the polarization is that you look at the angular distribution of uh, the positive lepton coming from um, quarkonium decay. And uh, from this angular distribution, you can extract different uh, parameters which provide you information about the polarization. Now in the equation on top, uh, these parameters are uh, dependent on the frame that you use, but uh, recently there have been a series of frame independent variables that have been introduced and uh, they directly give you information about uh, the polarization state of your quarkonium. And of course, they're very uh, nice because you can make uh, direct comparisons between uh, different experiments. So here you see uh, the result of the polarization of J psi, so the lambda tilde parameter uh, on the left for uh, stars, so looking at proton-proton collisions at mid-rapidity at uh, 200 GeV. And you see here that we don't observe any dependence on transverse momentum and that uh, the polarization is compatible with zero. Phoenix uh, also made this type of results uh, measurements and arrived at the same conclusions, but they did not only look at polarization at uh, mid-rapidity, but they also extracted a polarization at forward rapidity, as you can see on the plot on the right. And here, though, they observed that contrary to mid-rapidity, you see a large uh, polarization of J psi, which is uh, consistent here with a uh, longitudinal polarization of your J psi. Then there are also measurements of uh, CMS. They looked at the polarization of chi C2. Uh, and what they did actually is that they looked, they extracted the ratio of chi C2 and over chi C1. So the polarization of these two states that they extracted are uh, correlated. And here they looked at um, the frame dependent lambda theta parameter as a function of transverse momentum. And on the plot on the left, what they did, they assumed that chi C1 was unpolarized, and then they looked at the polarization that they would extract for chi C2, and these are given by the open uh, purple points. And uh, you see a large polarization, but actually it falls outside of the physically allowed region, which is indicated by these two uh, dashed lines. On the right hand side, these, uh, if, uh, they give us input um, results predicted by NRQCD for chi C1, then they extract uh, for as polarization results from uh, chi C2, uh, which shows that you see a large polarization, uh, even at a very large transverse momentum. Okay, now let me go over to exclusive quarkonium production. So when we look at exclusive quarkonium production in hadron hadron, we do this usually in ultra peripheral collisions. So where the two beam particles are at the distance uh, far away from each other so that hadronic interactions are suppressed and instead the beam particles interact electromagnetically. So if we look at the uh, exclusive vector meson production, you have one of your beam particles that would um, emit a quasi-real photon. This quasi-real photon would split into a quark-antiquark pair and this quark-antiquark pair would then interact with your other beam particle um, through a gluon exchange. And then finally, this uh, quark pair would evolve into a quarkonium state. Now, um, the uh, uh, flux of photons that is emitted uh, is proportional to uh, the atomic number squared. So if we look at proton lead collisions, uh, usually it's the lead ion that acts as real photon emitter and we are actually studying uh, the nucleon structure. If we work with lead lead ions, of course, we have some ambiguity into which of the two particles is the real photon emitter. So I think as most of you know, it's very nice to look at exclusive uh, production because we can access generalized parton distributions and learn about the 3D uh, distribution of quarks and gluons as a function of their longitudinal momentum and transverse position. Um, and Barbara will discuss this later today. Uh, and then at LHCs, if we're accessing very low X, we can actually also approximate the cross-section in terms of PDFs and, and that option, uh, LHC has a potential to constrain the PDFs at these very low values of, of X. And then, of course, if we probe low X, we are also sensitive to uh, saturation. Now, here you see results on the exclusive photoproduction on the nucleon. 
uh, of JF science, you see the cross section as a function of the photon proton invariant mass, or equivalently as a function of X Birkin, as indicated by the uh, upper X axis. And you see that uh, at LHC, we can reach uh, very low values of X, especially. Uh, Thanks to the forward geometry of LHCV, we can go down to X of 10 to the minus six. Now, let me highlight uh, the red points, which are the new results from Alice. They complement all the results uh, from Alice, and they both have been collected in proton-led interactions. And then there are also interact uh, results from uh, H1 and Zeus, which have were uh, accessed through measurements in EP scattering. And finally, the results from LHCB are collected in proton-proton interactions. And I think it's really nice to see that all these data points are uh, compatible with each other, which really hints at the fact that we are probing the same underlying physics. Then Alice also has new results at mid-rapidity in the exclusive production of JPSI and PSI2S in uh, lead-lead collisions. And if we compare these results with models, we see that uh, these results actually indicate uh, shadowing in the gluon PDF for uh, X around 10 to the minus three. And then on the right, uh, you see the very first results at LHC dependent on the uh, Mandelstam variable T, which is uh, very nice because the GPD is dependent on X, Birken, and T. But in addition, these uh, data points can uh, constrain several uh, models considering PDFs. Okay, now I'll go over and uh, end with spectroscopy. So, so far, I've talked about uh, conventional quarkonium states. But there are a whole series of uh, charmonium lag and botomonium lag uh, other states. And you see them here for all the ones of which uh, the quantum numbers have been determined. And they're ordered here according to their mass and their uh, quantum numbers. And looking, for example, at the figure on the left, all the states below the DD bar threshold are considered uh, conventional quarkonium states. But then all the ones, or many of the ones above, uh, are considered to be non-conventional. Um, but we know that they consist of a, a heavy quark, anti-quark pair, like a, because they, they do decay in, into a CC bar or BB bar states. And many of these states actually have quantum numbers that uh, fit the QQ bar, heavy QQ bar, or the, the quarkonium uh, behavior, but they have other properties that do not fit uh, conventional QQ bar states. Um, in addition, there are some states that have quantum numbers that do not fit at all the uh, conventional uh, quarkonium states. And these are, for the charmonium, these are the two columns on the right, and botomonium, the column on, on the right. And uh, since they have different uh, quantum numbers, they must be definitely uh, exotic states. Whereas for the others, there might still be some ambiguity. Charlotte, you have five minutes left. OK, thank you very much. Um, so when we consider exotic states, there are different uh, types of, of uh, uh, here now for tetra quarks that can be considered. So one is the compact tetra quark shown on the uh, top. So there you would have a heavy quark combining with a lighter quark, and you would actually have these uh, di quarks that would be uh, the important degrees of freedom. Then another model is hydroquarkonium, where you have a core of uh, the two heavy quarks bind together, and around you have these uh, lighter quarks. And then you have a hadronic molecule where you have uh, two hadrons that combine together uh, is actually uh, the deuteron. And then, of course, you can also have uh, states where uh, gluons, uh, with excited gluons uh, that determine uh, the quantum numbers. OK, so the very first charmonium-like state that was suspected to be non-conventional was uh, observed by Bell in 2003, it's the Chi-C1 state. Um, and it has been observed in different uh, decays, but now for the first time, CMS observed it in the decay of B sub BS0 going to Chi C1 uh, phi, where the Chi C1 is uh, reconstructed through its decay into J psi pi plus pi minus. And here on the two figures on the left, you see on the far left the J psi pi plus pi minus invariant mass spectrum, and next to this, you see the um, Chi C1 plus phi invariant mass spectrum. A bit later, LHCB also observed this decay, and you see on the right um, 
the corresponding invariant mass spectra, uh, which are very clean. Of course, LHGB has been designed for this, but I still find it rather surprising. Um, and the results both from CMS and LHCB are uh, compatible with each other. And then to try to understand uh, the inner structure of this Chi-C1, it's interesting to compare um, the branching fractions of Chi-C1 in different uh, decays. And let me highlight the two on the right. So here you see on the left, the ratio of B as zero going to Chi-C1 phi is uh, measured here, compared to uh, the one of B plus going to Chi C1 K plus. And they obtain a value of 0.5. And you, if you compare this to the same um, branching fractions, but now not for Chi C1, but for Psi 2S, then you see that uh, the, the, this uh, ratio gives a very different value. So this difference in value would hint at the fact that uh, Chi C1 um, is not a conventional charmonium like state and confirms actually uh, earlier observations. Then it's also interesting to look at prompt Chi C1 production. Um, and here you see results from LHCB. So you see the cross section ratio of Chi C1 compared to Psi 2S as a function of uh, the number of tracks in uh, the VLO detector. So as a function of the track multiplicity. And um, you see the results for prompt production in red and in black for Chi C coming from B decay. And let me take here some time to explain the models in order to give you an insight if, on how prompt production can help us understand the nature of Chi C1. So there are two models, the black and the blue, that consider Chi C1 to be a molecule. And then the red uh, considers Chi C1 to be a compact tetrachord. And if we look at first uh, the blue prediction there, they consider um, the Chi C1 so to be formed completely at the beginning of the interaction. And then the idea is that if you have a, a lot of hadronic activity, this molecule would actually very easily uh, disintegrate. And so you would expect that uh, your cross section goes down as a function of track multiplicity. On the other hand, another model considers that uh, the D and D star are formed in the beginning and then would combine together to form a Chi C1 molecule. And therefore, you would expect uh, that your cross section increases uh, with hadronic multiplicity because you have uh, more uh, DD bars around. You see, though, that none of the two models manages to describe the data. On the other hand, the uh, pink. Uh, band, which uh, corresponds to compact tetraquark production, thus uh, managed to describe the data. There is still some discussion about, about, uh, about these models, but uh, I think it's uh, already a nice result and it also is a nice illustration. Now, another region where we have a high hadronic activity is in lead lead collisions. And now, for the first time, uh, CMS also um, measured. Um, prompt Chi C1 production in lead lead collision. So also here, uh, this uh, production can help us to constrain the nature of Chi C1. Now, um, there's still some debate if uh, Chi C1 or other non-charged state are really exotic or not. But if we look at uh, charged uh, charmonium-like states, then we must deal with an exotic state because in, in addition to the heavy QQ bar, you need at least two light charge uh, quarks to, to provide uh, charge. And so LHCB looked at um, the invariant mass of uh, J psi uh, K plus, um, and they uh, using run one and run two data. So these uh, results are given here by the black um, data points. And on the bottom, you see the model that was used to describe uh, run one data. So this is given by the red curve. And then uh, the other colors indicate the subcomponents. But you see that this model isn't able to describe run one and run two data anymore. Instead, in order to make sure that uh, the new model could uh, describe the data, they needed to introduce uh, two new states, which are uh, two charged um, ZCS states. And these are actually the first exotic states containing uh, strange quarks. So that's very nice. Then uh, show you re results on the search for pentaquarks. So the very first observation for pentaquark state was through the decay of LB0 going to J proton and K minus and the J and they saw a structure in the J psi 
proton invariant mass. So this would indicate that the pentaquark has a UUDCC bar content. And this was first observed in 2015 by LHCB. And a few years later, a new pentaquark uh, state was observed. And in addition, they saw that the original peak at 4450 actually consisted of uh, two individual peaks. So now the idea is to look at the decay of Xi B minus to J Psi lambda K minus. And there we would then prop a pentaquark containing a strange quark. So here you see the results of the measurement performed by LHCB. So you see the environment mass of J Psi lambda. And indeed, we see some peak appear at the moment with a significance of uh, 3.1 sigma. And uh, so this needs to be confirmed. Uh, and in addition, it's not clear if this peak is a single peak or if it's a double peak structure as uh, similar to what was um, the case with the pentaquark. So uh, there are also many measurements still on conventional uh, variants. So uh, let me just mention the results from LHCB where they saw new excited XIB0 state. Also CMS ex uh, observed a new excited state now for the XIB minus. And uh, LHCB also uh, provided the first observations of uh, excited omega B minus states of which uh, two which with high significance. So in summary, a study of heavy quarks and flavors covers a very wide spectrum, which is nice. Um, we see that we understand fragmentation of mesons better than variants. Uh, also, we still we see that uh, the hadronic uh, environment in proton-proton uh, collisions could actually have an influence on fragmentation. So this should be investigated further. Uh, also, inclusive quarkonium production provides a very nice tool to study the nucleon and nucleus, but we still need to perform a lot of measurements in order to pin down uh, the production mechanism of quarkonium. Um, also, exclusive measurements of quarkonia give a very nice complementary study to uh, uh, EP scattering. Um, they're a bit more complicated, but they have this uh, very unique advantage of probing very low X region. And in addition, actually, in exclusive production, we could also learn something about the um, production mechanism of quarkonium. And then finally, I showed you some results on uh, spectroscopy. And there are many new states discovered every time, but um, the inner structure of all these states isn't understood yet. So, well, we can still perform many measurements. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. Is anyone has questions for Charlotte? Please raise your hands. Okay, Aaron, go on. Uh, hi, Charlotte. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, you showed on slide 17 the JPSI production. I couldn't see if you give a slope of the T distribution. Um, is there a slope measurement of the T distribution? I think they did, but I don't remember the, the value. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be probably they should have done this. Uh, interesting, of course. Uh, okay, I see. Uh, yeah, one can find it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Next question from Pavel. Uh, Charlotte, th thank you so much for this talk. Um, I would like to go back to the uh, statement on your in, on your summary slide that, um, of course, we are very interested to use uh, the, uh, uh, the let's say charmonium production to test um, the uh, structure of the proton, but yet there is no consensus on production mechanism. So I would like to ask you how pessimistic or optimistic you are about this last point. So is it possible that in the near future we will be able to use it? I'm quite optimistic in the sense that I've seen um, uh, I've, I've seen lately quite some activity on, on trying to understand this. Um, there are some workshops that have been organized by Jean-Philippe Lansberg recently to um, to really start to understand or use quarkonium. Uh, this also resulted in a, in a new document to study quarkonium at the LHC. The plan is also now to have some highlights on uh, quarkonium production um, at the EIC and to make a document for this and see how we could how the EIC could contribute. So of course, this is not something that happens from one day to the other, 
But given this rise in interest, I, I, I'm rather uh, optimistic. Okay. I think it's also always an interplay, right? Uh, it's, you can use it and then you learn and, and so on as with everything. Yes, but, but, but that said, we do want to have a, an agreed upon a theory for production so that we, we don't know that uh, any uncertainty comes, let's say, from the no perturbative dynamics inside uh, the nuclear, not, not from uh, uh, the, the theory. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Pavel. Uh, thanks a lot. Is there there's a question from Elke? Please go on. There's no question. I just wanted to make a comment. The EIC is very different because it's exclusive uh, quaconium production, so JPSI, and there is no uncertainty about the production mechanism. So therefore, 3D imaging and so on, you can immediately use it. Okay, thanks. Uh, is there any other question for Charlotte? Um, well, I'd like to comment on what Elke is saying. Yeah, I'm not sure why there's no uncertainty at all. I mean, you still need to describe your fragmentation of your QQ bar to your final state, JPSI, uh, if you use it in exclusive or for inclusive measurements. So it's, of course, much easier, but I don't think there is no uncertainty. The uncertainty is a wave function, and that for JPSI uh, can be even measured. So, but uh, there's, uh, the fragmentation is not the same as in an inclusive, where you have also an X, so that makes it easier. I, I, I think this is the kind of discussion that would be nice to have in Gather Town. So I propose yeah. that we, we, we stop the, the, the session here. So now we have a coffee break and we'll be back at, at four. Uh, sorry, uh, at four Amsterdam time. And of course, people are more encouraged to visit Gathertown now, to go there, you know, chat with their colleagues and friends, and hopefully, you know, get, get a flavor of in, in interactivity. And let me thank again all the speakers of this session, and then we'll see each other in more or less 15 minutes from now. Take one. Yes, we'll see in 15 minutes. Okay, perfect. <laughs>